A very warm welcome to everyone and thank you so much for joining us for Lecture 6 of the Cricket South Africa Level 1 umpiring course hosted by Western Province Cricket Umpires Association. My name is Abdullah Steenkamp and my co-presenter for this evening, as usual, will be Tom Mokarosi. The format of tonight's lecture will be as follows. This will be a revision lecture. I will cover all the, the slides that contain the lime green text in it because the exam questions are based on the slides that contain those lime green texts. After I've gone through all those slides, I will then hand over to Tom. Tom will then take you through a bit of admin as well as he will take you through a uh, mock exam where he will uh, guide you through how to log on, um, how to um, answer some of the questions. And after that, we will then open the floor for Q&A. So the first slide that had this lime green text in it was under law one when it comes to the number of players. So usually a match is played between two sides and each of 11 players. But there are times where a match may be played between sides of fewer than 11 or more than 11 players. So the law allows for this, but all the law tell us is that when they do, especially if they play with more than 11 players, not more than 11 players may field at any time. When it comes to the nomination and replacement of players, each captain to nominate his or her players in writing to one of the umpires before the toss. Can a player be changed after the toss uh, took place? Yes, the law allow for a player to be changed after the toss took place, uh, but there's one condition. The law tell us that if you are going to allow a player to be changed after the toss, it can only happen with the consent of the opposing captain. Umpires have no say here. Uh, if a player, if uh, a side wants a player to be replaced, and they inform the umpires, the umpires they need to go to the opposing captain and ask the the opposing captain permission if uh, he or she will allow this player to be changed. If yes, you will allow the uh, player to be replaced. If no. No concept is given. Unfortunately, that player may not be replaced. When it comes to the umpires, law tell us that the umpires needs to be at the ground at least 45 minutes before play is about to start. So if in, in let's use a test match as an example, play starts at 10 o'clock. According to the laws of cricket, umpires needs to be at the ground at least 9.15, 45 minutes before play starts. Are you allowed to change an umpire once the game has started? Yes, the law allows for it. The law tells us there are times when an umpire can become injured uh, or ill, and then the law allows for that injured umpire to be changed. Okay, but there is a condition that if you now do this, uh, do change the umpire because of an uh, injury or illness, that the new umpire can only stand at the striker's end. But there is a but here. Unless both captains agree that this new umpire can take full responsibility as an umpire. If both captains are happy that the replacement umpire can take full responsibility, no problem. That umpire can then stand at strikers in as well as bowlers in. But if there's no consent from the captains, the replacement umpire only to stand at 
the strikers in. Who are the judges of fair and unfair play? Umpires alone are the judges of fair and unfair play. When it comes to the fitness uh, for play, who judges the fitness for play? Again, solely for the umpires together to decide whether they feel that conditions of ground, weather, or light, or exceptional, exceptional circumstances means that it would be dangerous or unreasonable for play to take place. So again, umpires together needs to decide if they feel that the conditions of ground, weather, or light means that it would be dangerous or unreasonable for play to take place. When it comes to the suspension of play in dangerous or unreasonable conditions. So now the umpire, so, so let's use a test match as an example. It's now late in the day. Uh, it's starting to get uh, dark. According to the laws of uh, cricket, the law tells us that if one umpire feels that it is too dark for play to continue, that umpire feels that it's now the level of darkness has now made conditions dangerous or unreasonable. So if one umpire feels that it is dangerous or unreasonable, play needs to be suspended immediately. Again, law tell us only one umpire feels it's too dark and it's now conditions are not dangerous or unreasonable. Play needs to be suspended immediately. So you do not have to, and you do not need both umpires to say, yes, I think it's dark. According to the laws of cricket, if one umpire feels it is too dark and now conditions are dangerous or unreasonable, play then needs to be suspended immediately. In terms of the position of umpires, law just tell us umpires need to stand where he or she can specify and act upon uh, when EOC needs to make a decision. So when it comes to the strikers in umpire, 99% of the time the strikers in umpire needs to stand on the onside or on the leg side of the striker. The law do allow for the strikers in umpire to stand on the offside. Uh, but those are in circumstances of, let's say, uh, there's a lot of fielders around the bat on, on the leg side, like a short leg, a leg, uh, leg gully, a silly point, and it's uh, maybe obscuring the umpire's view of the pop increase and the stumps. In that case, umpire, the striker in umpire can decide to go stand on the offside. Sometimes a late setting sun, also in another example of when the umpire is then allowed to go stand on the offside of the wicket. But 99% of the time, the, um, the strikers in umpire needs to stand on the, on the onside or leg side. So now the strikers in umpire decided EOC now needs to go stand on the offside. Let's say it's a late setting sun and the sun is in the um, strikers in umpire's eyes. What does that umpire need to do? The umpire then needs to inform three parties. Firstly, before moving to the offside, umpire, the strikers in umpire needs to inform the fielding captain. Captain, I am moving to the offside. The strikers in umpire also needs to inform the striker that he or she is moving to the offside. And then lastly, the strikers in umpire, before moving to the offside, EOC also needs to inform the other uh, umpire. So just to summarize, there are three parties that needs to be informed once you move over to the offside. Just a hint uh, for the exam. So if there is a question like this, and there is a question like this in uh, in the exam. 
So what you need to take heed of is the law tell us three parties needs to be informed that you're moving to the offside. So if you see a question in the exam and they don't indicate all three parties, you need to just be aware, wary of it. That's just my hint. Three parties needs to be informed before moving over to the offside. When it comes to the scorers, law wants at two scorers to be appointed. And what are the duties of the two scorers? They need to record all runs scored in the game. They need to record all wickets taken in the game. And lastly, they need to record the number of overs that are bowled in the game. So three duties of the scorers. All runs scored, wickets taken, as well as overs that are bold. Again, I'm just going to focus on the lime green uh, portion because uh, um, that portion, uh, there is an exam question on it. When it comes to the ball and the uh, new ball, unless an agreement has been made before the, uh, the match, either captain may demand a new ball at the start of each innings. The law also allow in more day cricket that the captain of the fielding side has the option after 80 overs has been bowled to ask for a new ball. Only once 80 overs has been bowled, then there is the option available to the fielding captain to take a new ball. Doesn't have to take the new ball after 80 overs. The option is there. The fielding captain feels Uh, Tom, uh, is audio visible? Tom? Everything's fine, Dula. You can carry on, no problems. Okay, um, I thought I lost connectivity for a second. We, the, um, so just to summarize again, the fielding captain has the option of the 80 overs to exercise whether EOC wants a new ball. Doesn't have to exercise the option, but the option is there. And Lord tell us, 80 overs. When it comes to the bat, and it's the overall length of the bat, laws just tell us not to be more than 96.52 centimeters. Not more than 96.52 centimeters in length. There are also uh, dimensions for the width, the depth, and the edges, 10.8, 6.7, and 4 centimeters. The creases. The names of the creases is definitely in the exam. I'm giving you three free points. They're going to ask you to name the creases. They're going to give you a sketch and there's going to be letters next to the sketch, A, B or C. They're going to ask you, or A, name the crease. B, name that crease. C, name that crease. So I'm giving you three free marks. Know the names of your creases. So just to go over the names of the creases again, the front crease is called the popping crease. The crease where the stumps are pitched in, that is the bowling crease. And the return creases, there are two of them, they are next to the side. Return crease, one on either side, popping crease and uh, bowling crease. They're also going to ask you the dimension of these uh, creases. What are the length of these uh, creases? So when it comes to the popping crease, there's a minimum and um, you can use uh, either the metric or the imperial system. For me, uh, I feel the metric system uh, is much better. The, uh, the current um, measurement types are in metric, so I, I, for me, I'm comfortable using the metric system, but you can also use the imperial system when answering the questions in the uh, exam. So when it comes to the minimum length of the pop increase, 3.66 meters. The minimum length of the two return creases, 2.44 meters 
and the exact length of the pole increase is 2.64 meters. The length from the pole increase up until the, the pop increase, so the back edge of the pole increase, up until the back edge of the return of the pop increase, that length is 1.22 meters. So for me, a, a easy method, how I uh, memorize these length, lengths, I only focus on the length from the pole increase to the pop increase, uh, which is 1.22 meters. Because from that number, I can derive my return crease length and I can derive my pop increase length. So from the back edge of the pole increase till the back edge of the pop increase, that length is 1.22 meters. If you multiply this number, 1.22 times 2, you, you get 2.44 meters. And which is the exact length of my return increases. And then if you multiply 1.22 times 3, it gives you 3.66 meters, which is the minimum length of the popping crease. And then just to confirm the length of the bowling increase again, 2.66 meters. And this is an exact length and is measured from the inside edge of the return crease on the one end to the inside edge of the return crease um, on the other end. Another, before I go on to law nine, another tip that I'm giving you in the, the exam, please take note of the arrows. The arrows is going to guide you on the length that they're looking for for the creases. So just to confirm again, the length of the pop increase, the minimum length is 3.66 meters. Pole increase, minimum uh, um, exact length is 2.64. Return increases, minimum length 2.44 meters. But now my tip is, you need to look at the arrows in the sketch that they're going to give you in the exam. You need to see where those arrows are uh, starting and where the arrows uh, end. So if in the exam, when you look at the, the sketch that they give you, if the if you see the arrow starts up way past the uh, the return crease on the one side to the other side, you know they're looking for the full length of the pop increase, and you need to put down either 12 feet or 3.66 meters. If the arrow uh, on the pop increase is only from middle stump to the one side, they're only looking for half the measurement of the return of the pop increase. So please take note of the arrow. Similarly, uh, the bowl increase, the full length of the bowl increase. If you see the arrows go from return crease to return crease, uh, um, then they're looking for the full length of the bowl increase, which is 2.64 meters. But if the arrows only goes from middle stump to the inside edge of the return crease. What are they then looking for? They're looking for half the, the measurement of the bowling crease. They're not looking for the full length, only half, which is 1.32 meters. So please take note of the arrows, where they start and where they end. Law nine. We covered the mowing of the pits, which says pits and outfield need to be mown on each day of the mats. When it comes to the timing of the mowing, all the law tell us that mowing of the pits needs to be completed not later than 30 minutes before play is about to start. So an example in our test mats, let's say play starts at 10 o'clock. All law tell us when it comes to the mowing of uh, the pits, this is now on day two, day three, day four, and day five. Mowing needs to be completed before 9.30. 10 o'clock start, not later than 9.30. Mowing needs to be done. Mowing of the outfield, 15 minutes before play is about to start. So a 10 o'clock start, outfield needs to be mown 9.45. 
should be done. When it comes to the rolling of the pits, this is now once the game has started. Before the game has started, the grounds curator can roll to his or her heart's content. The game hasn't started yet. They're busy preparing the pits. But once the game has started, when it comes to the rolling of the pits and the duration of this rolling, so when can the, roll, when can, uh, um, the pits be rolled after the match has started? It can only be rolled on the start of each subsequent day's play. Like uh, the start of day two, uh, the start of before the start of day three, before the start of day four, before the start of day five, the pitch can then be rolled. And secondly, before the start of each innings, let's say team A uh, batted first, now they get dismissed. Before the innings uh, starts of team B, they are allowed uh, to roll. So those are the two instances after the game has started, when the rolling is allowed, before start of each innings, and before the start of each subsequent day's play, day two, day three, day four, and day five. So now we know when rolling can take place. How long can rolling take place? All law tell us is not more than seven minutes. So can the batting captain roll for five minutes? Yes, the batting captain can. Can the batting captain roll for four minutes? Of course, he, uh, he or she can. Can the captain roll for one minute? Yes, he or she can roll for one minute. All the law tell us not more than seven minutes of rolling to take place. So in terms of the timing permitted for the rolling before place to start on day two, day three, day four, and day five. There's a window period for this rolling to take place. And this rolling, this window period is not more than 30 minutes, not less than 10 minutes before play is about to start. So on day two, if play is about to start at 10 o'clock, your window period for rolling to take place before the start of the day's play is 9.30 and 9.50. 9.50 is the latest that you can that you can start your rolling. So that's your window period. I want to emphasize again, window period for rolling before the game start, uh, before uh, uh, subsequent days are 9.30 to 9.10. 9.30 to 9.50. We're going to get to the window period uh, for the toss, which is a totally different window period. But the window period for rolling is 9.30 to 9.40. In the next slide or two, we're going to get to the window period that the toss uh, needs to take place. Uh, when I just started, I, I initially uh, got confused between these two window periods. I'm telling you, don't get confused. There are different window periods. The one window period is for, ro is for rolling on subsequent days. And that window period is if the... If the, uh, the uh, play is about to start 10 o'clock on day two, three, four, and five. That window period is 9.30 till 9.50. There's a different window period for the toss to take place, and we're going to get to that in, the, uh, in a few slides time. When it comes to intervals, there are five type of scheduled intervals. They are period between close of play on, on, day, on one day and the start of play on the next day. So in our test match, uh, uh, let's say our hours are from 10 to 5. Uh, the next day, on the, that's day 1. Day 2, play will also start at 10 and end at day 5. So the period between 5 o'clock on day 1 and 10 o'clock, the start of play on day 2, that, according to the law, is a scheduled interval. Interval between innings, the 10-minute interval between innings is also a scheduled interval. Your intervals for lunch and tea, also a scheduled interval. Your interval for drinks, also a scheduled interval. And lastly, any other agreed interval that was agreed before the game started, that is also seen as a scheduled uh, interval. How long is your interval between innings? Law tell us that interval is 10 minutes. And that interval shall be taken 
from the moment that uh, the innings ended, when that last wicket is taken, and 10 minutes later when the first ball needs to be bowled. So if the innings ended, uh, let's say Team A was dismissed at 11.30, the first ball needs to be bowled for Team B at 11.23. So there's a concept in the law where we where we try to save a bit of time. And, and one of these things is when an innings ends, where the team declares or where the team gets dismissed or bowled out, 10 minutes or less before the agreed time for close of play on any day, that will be close of play. That will be stumps on that day. I'll give you an example to illustrate what they mean. Uh, our close of play now test match is at 5 o'clock. If Team A gets dismissed at 16.50, it will be stumps. It will be close of play uh, for, let's say it's day one, it will be close of play on day one. Another example, Team A gets dismissed at 16.52. At this is also 10 minutes or less. It will also be stumps on that particular day. So any 10 minutes or less, when when you're uh, before close of play and an innings ends, it will be stumps for that particular day. Then law tell us, yes, even though you you ended ten minutes earlier on, let's say day one, in the first example when the innings ended at sixteen fifty, yes, technically we did end ten minutes earlier. But law tell us on the next day you will not start ten minutes earlier. In my second example when when uh, the team A was dismissed at 16.52. Yes, we we ended eight minutes earlier, but Lord tell us we will not start eight minutes earlier the following day. Again, the law is flexible. It allows you to maximize play uh, in the day. And one of those methods to maximize play uh, is that when an innings ends, when 30 minutes or less remains before the agreed time for the T interval, you shall then take that interval immediately. The change of innings interval will then be incorporated uh, into the T interval. I use an example to illustrate this. Let's say our T time is at 3 o'clock. Team A gets dismissed at 14.30. What happens next? Law tell us. When an innings ends 30 minutes or less before the agreed time for T, you need to take the T interval immediately. So in our example, when Team A was dismissed at 14.30 with our T interval at 1,500 hours, was this 30 minutes or less before the agreed time for T? Yes, it was. So in this instance, T needs to be taken immediately. T will be 20 minutes duration, so from 14.30 till 14.50 will be T and your 10 minute change of innings interval will be incorporated into uh, your T time. If a side gets dismissed at 14.38, what happens next? We follow the law, law tell us. If it's 30 minutes or less before the agreed time for T, you'll take T, T immediately. So in my second example, the innings ended at 14.38, so this is less than 30 minutes before the agreed time for T. We will now take T immediately. Our T interval will start from 14.38 and it will be 20 minute uh, duration. And we will restart after the T interval at 14.58 and the 10 minute change of innings uh, interval will be incorporated into the uh, T interval. Again, to maximize play, the lawmakers decided that when we get to either your lunch or your tea interval, because the same principle apply, whether it's lunch uh, or tea. So when, so and I'll just use lunch as an example, because the same principle applies to tea. So when you get to your lunch interval and the team is nine wickets down, no tell us, you will not take T, uh, the, the lunch, when the, if a team is nine wickets down when you've reached your time for lunch, you 
will extend the session by a maximum of 30 minutes. You play a maximum of 30 minutes to, uh, to see whether the fielding side can take the 10th uh, wicket. If after 30 minutes they're not able to take the 10th the wicket, you then need to call lunch after 30 minutes. If they do take the 10th wicket uh, before the 30 minutes expired, then you take lunch from that moment and lunch will be 40 minutes duration. I'll use examples just to illustrate this point. So in our test match, lunch is at 12 o'clock. Team A is 250 for the last of nine uh, wickets when we get to 12 o'clock. So now it's the end of the over. You look at your watch and you see it's 12 o'clock. Do you take uh, your lunch now at 12 o'clock? No, you don't take your lunch at 12 o'clock. Why don't you take your lunch? Because Lord tell us, if a side is nine wickets down, you need to delay your lunch interval by a max of 30 minutes. So now you need to continue playing. You, you, you will now uh, see whether the fielding side can take the 10th wicket in the max 30 minutes that they allowed. So let's say they don't take the, the 10th wicket in the max 30 minutes that we've allowed. So now we get to 12.30 and they still uh, nine wickets down because there's only a max of nine we minutes, uh, 30 minutes that we can extend the session. When we reach 12.30 and it's the end of the over, we now need to call uh, over time and lunch. We'll take lunch at 12.30 and we will restart at 13.10. If the side do take the 10th wicket, let's say they take it at 12.10, it will then be lunch immediately when the final wickets get taken at 12.10. Lunch will then be 40 minutes duration. Lunch will be from 12.10 until 12.50. First ball needs to be bowled at 12.50 and you will the change of innings interval will be incorporated into our lunch interval. And again, uh, same principle applies to T. So lunch and T, same principle if a side is nine wickets down. And just to emphasize again, the side must be nine wickets down to uh, for this clause to be activated. If they're not nine wickets down, you cannot activate this clause. If a side is eight wickets down, and when you reach 12 o'clock, you cannot activate this clause. Side must be nine wickets uh, down. Uh, in an, uh, another example, let's say at lunch is at 12 o'clock and at 11.58, the, uh, the batter gets bowled against, uh, uh, against, the, um, against uh, the neck. And um, after getting treatment, the batter then decides um, EOC is going to retire, and the side and the score at that stage is 250 for the last of eight wickets. So now 1158, Patrick is bowled against the neck, decides to retire. What happens next? So it's it's two minutes to go to your official lunch uh, lunch time. Can you invoke this clause? Can this clause be activated? No, this clause cannot be activated. Why not? The side is only eight wickets down. This clause can only be activated when there's nine wickets down. We'll see in a, in a slide or two uh, what happens if a batter either gets dismissed or a batter retires when there are two or uh, less than three minutes to go before the interval. We'll get that later on, but just the point I'm trying to, to make here is you can only activate this clause by playing an additional 30 minutes if a side is nine wickets down at uh, either the lunch or the tea interval. When it comes to the interval for drinks, all the law tell us is the drinks interval not to exceed five minutes. So in test cricket, the drinks interval is four minutes. Uh, you can have it uh, shorter. All the law tell us should not be longer than five minutes when it comes to your uh, drinks interval.
When it comes to completion of an ovum, law tell us that if having reached your agreed time for the interval, you need to complete the ovum, and there is an exception. So now in our test match, lunch is at 12 o'clock. So now at 12 o'clock, you look at your watch and you see it's 12 o'clock, but you've only bowled three balls in the over. What do you do? You take a uh, lunch midway through the over. No, Lord tell us. If you midway in the over, you need to complete the over before you take lunch. There is an exception. What is that exception? If with less than three minutes to go before the agreed time for, uh, let's say, your lunch interval. Similarly, same principle apply to your tea interval, but let's use lunch. If less than three minutes remains before the agreed time for your lunch interval, if either a batter is dismissed or a batter uh, retires hurt or players needs to leave the uh, field, you will then take lunch immediately. So only if less than three minutes remains and a batter is dismissed or batter retires or players needs to leave the field, if that is the case, you will then take lunch immediately. Example, let's say side A is 240 for five. We've now reached 11.59 and we know lunch, uh, lunch is um, at 12 o'clock. So we, start the, we, will, we need to start another over. So the first ball of the over, the batter is now clean bold. So what do we do next? It's on our watch, it's only 11.59. Lunch is at 12 o'clock. What do we do? We get guided by the law. Point number two tell us, if a batter is dismissed three, less than three minutes before the agreed time for our interval, that interval will be taken immediately. So our lunch, we will take lunch immediately at 11.59 and our lunch interval will be from 11.59 until 12.39. When it comes to the toss, according to the law, who needs to be present? Both captains needs to be there, and at least one umpire needs to be present at the toss. Where does the toss needs to be take place? On the field of play. Anywhere on the field of play, the toss can take place. Yes, I know custom and tradition is toss to takes place right next to the match pitch that is that is custom and tradition uh how it's been done uh, all the years uh, but law tell us anyway on the field of play and what is the window period for the toss to take place if um, uh, the uh, our test match starts at 10 o'clock the window period for the toss to take place is between 9 30 and 9 45. It's only a 15 minute window period for a toss. And again, I got confused with this when I, st when I started. Don't get confused with the window period for the toss and the window period for rolling to take place on subsequent days. The window period for the toss is um, 9.30 till 9.45. Decision to be notified immediately as soon as the toss is completed the captain who won the toss needs to notify the opposing captain immediately on whether he or she is going to bowl or bat it needs to happen immediately captain cannot tell you ambassadors give me a second i want to discuss this with my team and my coach i'll get back to you you tell the care the captain no captain you need to inform me immediately whether you're going to bowl or bat. When it comes to the follow on, in a five day test match, the lead needs to be at least 200 runs for the captain to have the option to enforce the follow on. So in a, in a, in a, in a match of five days or more, these days we don't have uh, matches of more than five days, but many years ago we, we had uh, matches of more than five days, but the longest format these days uh, is test match cricket, which spans over five days. So in a five-day test match, the first innings, the lead needs to be at least 200. If the lead is 200, the captain has the option of asking 
the uh, opposing captain to follow on. Doesn't have to enforce the follow on, but the option is there. We all know that not all games are five uh, matches are five days uh, in the provincial competition in South Africa. Uh, so cricket South Africa plays four day uh, cricket. And what is the, the lead in four day cricket? It's 150 runs. So in, whether the match is three days or four days, that lead needs to be at least 150 runs for the captain to have the option to enforce the follow on. In a two day match, the lead needs to be at least 100 runs to have the option of enforcing the uh, follow on. When the first day of play is lost in, in a more day game, and let's use the, uh, our test match as an example. And I want to put emphasis on, it must be the first day of our test match. No play needs to take place on the first day of our test match. So if no play takes play on our first day of our test match, not a single ball was bowled, the umpire, the over didn't start on the first day of our test match. If that is the case, and let's say play only starts on day number two, so now in terms of the follow-on lead, law now tell us in our test match that spans over five days, because no play took place on the first day of the test match, what will now be our minimum lead in terms of the follow-on? So if I go back to the previous slide, where we need a four-day game, the minimum lead needs to be 150 run, runs. So in our test match, because there was no play on the first day of our test match, and play only started on day, on day number two, the minimum lead will now be 150 runs. Again, emphasis on it needs to be the first day of play that is lost. Uh, if another example, if play should, uh, let's say now five day test match, play starts on time on day number one, and we get a full day from first ball gets bowled at 10 o'clock, and we, and we go till close of play at five o'clock. Now day two gets rained out completely, and we only start again on, on day number number three. What happens now in terms of the minimum lead, it stays 200 runs uh, because yes, we lost a full day's play, but we but the full day's play that we lost was day number two. The law only tell us only if the first day of day's play is lost, then you can activate the clause where um, you, it's now a four day match if play starts on day two and now your minimum lead will be 150 runs. When it comes to the declaration, captain of the side batting may declare an innings close whenever the ball is dead during that innings. So who, who can declare the innings? The captain of the batting side declares an innings close once the ball is dead. Captain of the batting side makes the declaration. When it comes to the over, when does the over start? Law tell us the over starts as soon as the bowler starts his or her run up. As soon as the bowler takes his or her first step, that's when the over starts. That's when that ball becomes uh, alive. If the bowler has no uh, run-up, the over then starts uh, when his or her bowling action, when the back foot lands, that's when the over starts. But usually most bowlers have a run-up, the over starts when he or she takes that first step, that's when the over uh, technically starts. When it comes to uh, the boundary, so if the boundary is marked by a white line, the edge of the line nearest to the pitch shall be the boundary. You need to look at the, uh, the edge nearest to the pitch. That will mark the boundary. If you look at this diagram, 
just to emphasize what the law is saying, the edge of the line, the edge, the line nearest to the pitch, nearest where the arrow is, that marks the boundary, not the back line, not on the line, but the edge nearest to the pitch. When it comes to dead ball, the ball becomes automatically dead when it finally settles in the hands of the wicketkeeper or of the bowler. Ball automatically becomes dead when it finally settles in the hands of the wicketkeeper or of the bowler. And there are other instances where the ball automatically becomes dead, boundary scored, batters dismissed, there's uh, eight of them where it automatically becomes dead. But I put my emphasis on when it is finally settled in the hands of the wicketkeeper and the bowler. And once that happens, uh, and in your opinion, it's now finally settles in, is settled in the hands of the wicketkeeper and the bowler, the ball then automatically becomes dead. Under the no ball law, we're going to start focusing on the feet and how the law look at how you need to call nobles when it comes to the feet. We're going to start with the back foot. The law tells us that when it comes to the back foot, the crease that's linked to the back foot is the return crease. So law tells us that the bowler's back foot must land within and not touch the return crease for his or her mode of delivery. So when it comes to the back foot, you look at the return crease and the back foot must not must land within and not touch the return crease. When it comes to the front foot, which crease goes with the front foot? The popping crease goes with the front foot. So back foot return crease, Front foot, the popping crease. So what does the law tell us? When it comes to the front foot, the, uh, the front foot must land with some part of the foot, whether it's grounded or raised, behind the popping crease. So upon first landing, there must be part of the front foot, whether it's grounded or raised, behind the popping crease. And also, when that front foot lands, there must also be part of the front foot on the same side of the imaginary line joining the two middle stumps. There is a, 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 um, a sketch that will illustrate bullet point number two that's going to make it easier to understand. But just to summarize again, back foot, return crease, and the back foot must land within and not touching front foot. Front foot must land with uh, some part of the foot with the ground or the raised behind the popping crease. So let's look at a few picks and let's start with the front foot. So which line goes with the front foot? You only, when it comes to the front foot, you only look at the, the popping crease. And what question do you ask yourself? Is there part of the front foot where the ground or the raise behind the popping crease? Yes. So I'm happy with the front foot. When it comes to the back foot, which foot, uh, which crease goes with the back foot? The return crease. So is there any part of the back foot Touching the return crease? Yes. So in this case, this is a no ball. This is a right arm bowler bowling over the wicket. Let's look at the front foot first. Which foot goes, which crease goes to the front foot? The popping crease. Any part of the front foot with the grounder to raise behind the popping crease? Yes. We're happy with the front foot. Back foot. Any part of the back foot touching the return crease? No. No part of the back foot touching the return crease. That's why we're happy with this delivery. It's a fair delivery. This is a left arm bowler bowling round the wicket. So when it comes to the front foot, which crease goes with the front foot? The popping crease. So looking at the front foot, is there any part of the front foot whether grounded or raised behind the popping crease? Yes, there is part of the front foot behind the popping crease. So we're happy with the front foot. Let's look at the back foot. Is there any part of the back foot touching the return crease? No, there's not. So this is a fair delivery. This is again left arm bowler bowling around the wicket. When it comes to the front foot, we look at the popping crease. 
Is there any part of the front foot where the ground to raise behind the popping crease? Yes, so we're happy with the front foot. Back foot, any part of the back foot touching the return crease? Yes, so that's why this is a no ball. We start with the back foot. Any part of the back foot touching the return crease? No, happy with the back foot. Front foot, any part of the front foot where the ground or raised behind the back edge of the popping crease? So when it comes to judging the popping crease, you judge the back edge, not the front edge. So you need to ask yourself, any part of the front foot where the ground or raised behind the back edge of the popping crease? If your answer to that question is yes, in this case, there is a portion of the heel behind the back edge of the popping crease, so we're happy that this is a fair delivery. You start with the back foot. Is the back foot touching the return crease? No, it's not, so we're happy with the back foot. Front foot. Is there any part of the front foot with a grounded or raised behind the back edge of the popping crease. No, there's no part of the front foot behind the back edge of the popping crease. So that's why this is a no ball. Uh, this pick, you should get the back foot first. Any part of the back foot with a grounded or raised behind the behind the uh, any part of the back foot touching the return crease. No, we happy with the back foot. Front foot. Any part of the front foot with the grounded or raised behind the back edge of the popping crease? No, there's not. So that's why this is a no ball. I want to emphasize also when judging the front foot, it is upon first landing. That is where you make your judgment call. Not where the bowler ends up, where the bowler, that first landing. You, you, you sometimes find a bowler first landing, uh, will be behind the, the popping crease, and then after landing, that front foot slides, maybe the the the, the, the pitch is uh, a bit slippery, or the, the spikes is uh, not good enough, then the bowler, the front foot might slide. So your judgment should be upon first landing. That's where you need to make your call. Not where it ends up, where it first lands. And let's assume in this pick, that was the first landing, and because there's no part of the front foot with the ground of the race behind the popping crease, that's why this is a no ball. Back foot, we're happy. Not touching the return crease. Front foot, is there any part of the front foot with the ground or race behind the back edge of the popping crease? Yes, so this is a fair delivery. Back foot, we're happy. Not touching the return crease. Front foot. Is there any part of the front foot with a grounded or raised behind the back edge of the popping crease? No, there's no part of the front foot uh, behind the back edge of the popping crease. Hence, this is a no ball. So what happens if a ball bounces more than once or it rolls along the ground? Law tell us that. The umpire to call and signal no ball if a ball that was delivered without having previously touched the battle person of the striker bounces more than once. I want you to take note of the law tell us if it bounces more than once, not more than twice, not more than three times, it, if it bounces more than once or it rolls along the ground before reaching the popping crease, if that happens, either umpire to call and signal no ball. Although the strikers in umpire is in the best position to make the score, uh, uh, nothing stopping the bowlers in umpire to call it, but the strikers in umpire is definitely in a better position. So bounces more than once. When it comes to calling and signaling of a wide, law tell us that after you've adjudged the delivery to be a wide, you only call and signal wide ball when the ball passes the striker's wicket. Do not call wide too early. Delay that call slightly until the ball passes the striker's wicket. You need to see whether the, the uh, batter maybe touches the ball or maybe uh, uh, the ball brushes uh, part of the person of, of the striker. That's why wait till it passes the striker's wicket before calling and signaling uh, wide ball. Although the law tells us 
Delay your call of wide slightly. Do not call it too early. You don't want to call wide ball and then the striker edges it or, or late cuts it to, to third man. Delay it until he passes the striker's wicket. Uh, but law tell us, technically, the, uh, uh, the law considered the ball to, to have been wide from the instant that the bowler entered his or her delivery stride. So technically, according to the law, that is when the ball is actually already wide. Once the bowler has entered his or her delivery stride. When does the bowler enter his or her delivery stride? When the back foot lands. That is when technically, according to the law, the ball is wide. Uh, even though law tell us, even though technically it is considered wide from the moment that the bowler's entered his or her delivery stride, i.e. when that back foot lands. But when it comes to calling it, verbally calling it, delay that call until it passes the striker's wicket. How can you be dismissed of a wide? There are four methods to be dismissed of a wide. Firstly, hit wicket. Secondly, obstructing the field. Thirdly, run out. And lastly, stumped. Four methods to be dismissed of a wide. Law 24 deals with substitutes and fielders' absence. When will the umpires allow a substitute fielder? If the umpires are satisfied that the fielder has become injured or ill, and that this injury or in illness occurred during the match. That's the criteria that the umpire needs to follow when in deciding whether EOC will allow a substitute fielder or not. Is, is the fielder uh, injured or ill? And did this occur during the match? If yes, you'll allow a substitute uh, fielder. Also, for any only acceptable reason, you shall also allow a substitute fielder. And now, once you've allowed the substitute fielder, the substitute fielder shall not be allowed to bowl, nor bat, nor act as captain in the game. Uh, although the law allows for the substitute to act as the wicketkeeper, but only with the consent of the umpires. So what happens if a field is absent or a fielder needs to leave the field uh, of play? Uh, players used to abuse uh, the, this law. They would fake uh, uh, injury just to go off, to have a rest, to have a, a rub down, to have a sour. The lawmakers just tightened this law slightly. So what, what did they decide? They decided that, yes, if a fielder comes to you and, and say, I'm, pa, I am, um, I'm injured, what you need to do as an umpire, the fielder needs to come to you and that fielder needs to inform you that EOC is leaving the field and why EOC is leaving the field. What do you, what do you then do as the umpire? You take out your notebook, you write down the name, uh, Abdullah uh, left, uh, is leaving the field, um, let's say it's hamstring, and time that he leaves the field is 10.30. So you need to write the name, reason, and time. We'll see now why it's important to write the time. Then law tell us, after the injured fielder receives some treatment, before that injured fielder can return to the field of play, that injured fielder needs the consent of the umpire. And we will now see why, why it's important to get consent, because before the fielder can uh, return to the field, needs to get the permission of the umpire, because the umpire needs to make a note in his or her notebook that the injured player is now returning, and the umpire then needs to calculate how long the fielder, the injured fielder has been off the field. Why is this important? Uh, let's say the injured fielder left at 10.30 and returned with the permission of the umpire at 10.50. So the injured fielder was off for 20 minutes. So because now the law tells us, before that injured fielder is now allowed to bowl, the UC needs to be on the field of play for the same amount of time that the EOC was off the field of play, max 90 minutes. 
I'll use an example to illustrate this. So Fielder was off, went off at 10.30, returned at 10.50. So before that Fielder can bowl again, that Fielder needs to wait 20 minutes. So from 10.50, need to wait 20 minutes. When can the injured Fielder bowl again? At 11.10. So when that injured fielder returns, you'll inform that injured fielder that you've been off for 20 minutes. You need to wait 20 minutes before you can bowl. You can bowl again at 11.10, and you'll also inform his or her captain when you see can bowl. And the maximum penalty time that a player can serve, according to the laws, is 90 minutes. So even if a fielder is off for, let's say, three, four hours for, for whatever reason, Let's say uh, hamstring, uh, hamstring injury and the fielder gets treatment, uh, um, uh, quite extensive treatment, off for three, four hours. Even though off for three, four hours, the maximum penalty time, according to the laws, is 90 uh, minutes. Also, law tell us that penalty time doesn't disappear. Lots of players, even when I, in my playing days, you know, you think uh, in the next innings, uh, you know, playing uh, penalty time will disappear. In the next day, penalty time will disappear. No, penalty time does not disappear. It gets carried forward into the next day, into the next uh, uh, innings. Also, if a player leaves the field on more than one occasion, and each time that player leaves, you need you will add up all those unserved penalty uh, penalty time. Doesn't disappear. You will add them up every time. Law also tell us any scheduled interval, whether it's lunch, tea, drinks, shall not count for, nor does it count against uh, the the player. Just an example to illustrate this: uh, our lunchtime is at twelve o'clock. At eleven forty, the uh, player X goes off the field. So eleven forty, lunch is at twelve o'clock. When every when the players leave the field, player X, the injured player, returns after lunch at twelve forty. How much penalty time does does the injured player owe us? So injured player was off from 10 for, from 11.40 till 12. So that's 20 minutes when we took lunch. We return after lunch at 12.40. So you will not add that 40 minutes to the penalty time. The definition of penalty time is playing time that the player is not on the field. So while play was in progress and a player is not on the field, that is penalty time. You will not add a, a scheduled interval to a player's penalty time. So in, in my example, player left at 11.40, it was lunchtime at 12, at 12 o'clock, so the player was off the field for 20 minutes. So when play restarts at 12.40, and that injured player now returns with, with the side after the lunch interval, all that player owes is 20 minutes of penalty time. So he or she can bowl again, um, 20 minutes after 12.40, which is 1 o'clock. So just the point I'm trying to illustrate is you will not add your scheduled interval to the penalty time. I mentioned earlier, penalty time to get carried into the next and subsequent days, as well as into the next innings of uh, the match. In terms of the are time with penalty time not to be incurred, external blow and it happens during the match on the field of play and also for a only acceptable reason penalty time not to be incurred when it comes to appeals and the timings of the appeal law tell us for appeal to be valid it must be made before the bowler begins his or a run-up or if there's no run-up the bowling action and before time has been called. So there's quite a, a long window period while that uh, appeal is still valid. So let's say the uh, uh, appeal can still be valid even if it's the sixth ball of the over and you've now called over and you've now moved into, into your position. That window period is still open. It only closes once the over starts, once that bowler takes his or her first step for the next over, only then does the window period uh, closes. The call of over does, and as I explained, does not invalidate an appeal as long as it's made prior to the start of the following over 
prior to that first step being taken and also as long as time has not been uh, called. Court, let's look at a video. Fair catch. A catch shall be considered fair if the ball is held in a fielder's hand, hugged to the body of the catcher, or accidentally lodges in his or her clothing, helmet, or protective equipment. But of course, this being cricket, it isn't always that simple. If a fielder deliberately uses an item of clothing to try to catch the ball, it is not out and five penalty runs are awarded to the batting side. However, the ball can be caught after it has deflected off the other batsman, an umpire, another fielder, including off a helmet being worn, or even if it lodges in a fielder's helmet. Perhaps the main criterion for a catch to be considered fair is that the ball must not touch the ground before being caught. Here, for example, the ball does not touch the ground even though the hand holding it does so in affecting the catch. This is a fair catch. And then there is the question of catches near the boundary. This is such an interesting subject that we've given it a film all of its own. To catch up on everything to do with catching, simply refer to Law 33 in the Blue Book. Just want to highlight uh, two things from that video. So, cats can be taken if it ricochets off the helmet. Also, cats can be taken if it lodges in the helmet, if it lodges in the grill. No runs to be scored if a batter is dismissed caught. And court to take precedence. Court takes priority over any other dismissal except bold. So bold is number one. If a, if a batter is uh, dismissed uh, uh, on uh, more than one mode of dismissal and one of them is bold, bold is number one. Dull, bold will take priority. Who's number two? Court is number two. Even if there's more than one dismissal uh, of a delivery and one of them is not bold and one of them is court, court will take priority court to take precedence over any other dismissal except bold. Bold number one, court number two. Leg before wicket. Leg before wicket. LBW. Ah! LBW is a little like the offside rule in football. Many people claim to know it, but how many people really do? Our handy checklist means that whether you find yourself umpiring an international test match or the kids on the beach, your reputation for fairness will remain intact. There are five basic criteria to consider. The batsman is out, leg before wicket, if one, the bowler bowls a ball that isn't a no ball, unlike this poor fellow. Two, the ball, if it is not intercepted on the full, pitches in line between wicket and wicket or on the offside of the batsman's wicket. It cannot be out if the ball pitches outside the line of the leg stump. Three, the ball hits the batsman either full pitch or after pitching and before he hits it with his bat. Four. Ah, this is where it gets a bit more complicated. If the batsman was making a genuine attempt to play the ball, the point of impact must be between wicket and wicket for LBW to be an option. However, if the batsman has made no genuine attempt to play the ball, the contact must either be between wicket and wicket or outside the line of the off stump. Five. This is the crucial part. But for the interception by the batsman, the ball would have gone on to hit the stumps and dislodge the bales. Any questions? 
just refer to Law 36 in the Blue Book. So just to go over those LBW points that you uh, consider. Ball not to be a no ball. Pitches in line between wicket and wicket or on the off side of the wicket. That's why if it pitches outside the leg stump, can never be out. So it needs to either pitch in line between wicket and wicket or on the off side of uh, the wicket. Should not have touched the bat first of the batter. So if it touches the bat first and then the pad, can never be out LBW. But if it touches the pad first and then the bat, then you can consider the LBW. There's still other points that you need to consider, but the point I'm trying to make here is if it touches pad first, then bat, you can consider it. But if it touches bat first and then bat, don't consider the LB. It's not out. The ball can be intercepted with any part of the person of the striker. Yes, I know it's LBW, leg before wicket, but Law tell us any part of the pers person of the striker. Then you can consider the LBW appeal. When it comes to the point of impact, the law wants the point of impact when considering an LBW appeal be, uh, to be between wicket and wicket. There's one exception. So just to emphasize again, when it comes to the point of impact, it must be between wicket and wicket. One exception. What is that exception? If there's been no genuine attempt by the striker to play at the ball. No shot offered, no attempt to play at the ball. If that is the case, then the law tell us, then the impact can between, between, be between wicket and wicket, or it can even be on the off side of the wicket. We'll go through uh, pictures that will illustrate uh, bullet point number five clearly. But when it comes to the point of impact, if a shot gets played, the point of impact must be between wicket and wicket. The only time where you can consider if the impact is not between wicket and wicket is if the striker didn't make a genuine attempt to play at the ball. And lastly and crucially, you need to consider uh, if the ball would have gone on to hit the wicket. Let's just look at a few uh, picks. And in all these picks, let's assume uh, it's not a no ball and the ball didn't touch the bat. In this pick, right hand batter, where did the ball pitch? Pitched outside leg stump. So law tell us, if a ball pitch outside leg stump, can never ever be out LBW. Let's look at this pick and let's go through our, our points. What's the first point that we need to consider? Where did it pitch? Did it pitch between wicket and wicket or did it pitch on the off side of the wicket? In this pick, it pitched between wicket and wicket. Next thing to, con uh, to consider, and let's assume it didn't uh, touch the, the bat. Where was the impact? Was the impact between wicket and wicket? Yes, the impact was between wicket and wicket. And what is the last thing that you need to consider? Would it have gone on to eat the stumps? If for your opinion, if this, you think this would have gone on to eat the stumps, give the better out LBW. Let's go through our points. Did it pitch between the wicket and wicket or on the off side of the wicket? Yes, it pitched on the off side of the wicket. Where was the impact? Was the impact between uh, wicket and wicket? No, the impact was not between wicket and wicket. And because the impact was not between wicket and wicket, and the batter is playing a shot. That's why this can never be out LBW because impact outside of or impact outside the line. It needs to be that impact needs to be between wicket and wicket. In this one, where did the ball pitch? Pitch outside off stump. So we're happy with where it pitch. Where was the impact? Yes, the impact is not between wicket and wicket. But remember, there was there was one exception. If the batter does not make a genuine attempt to play at the ball, you can consider the LBW even if the impact is outside off stump. So in this instant instance, you can consider this. Uh, you can consider this LBW uh, south. But remember, you still need to consider that important last point. In your opinion, would it have gone on to hit the stumps? If your answer to that question is yes, give the striker out LBW. If the answer to that question is no. 
not out LBW. Again, we go through our points. Did it pitch on the offside or between wicket and wicket? So we're happy with, yes, it pitched between wicket and wicket. So we're happy with the way it pits. Impact, was the impact between the wicket and wicket? Yes, the impact was between the wicket and wicket. Would it have gone on to hit the stumps? That's your opinion. If the answer to that question is yes, out LBW. If no, not out. Did it pitch between wicket and wicket or on the offside? Yes, it pitched between wicket and wicket. Was the impact between wicket and wicket? Yes, the impact was between wicket and wicket. Would it have gone on to hit the stumps? Again, uh, LBW is an opinion law. So in my opinion, and looking at where the ball pitch, looking at angles, I think this is a left arm bowler bowling over the wicket to this right hand batter. So this ball pitching just uh, uh, in line, it pitches between the wicket and wicket. Look where it hits. Look at the angle. Look at the stride that the batter got in. Uh, we've, uh, we saw earlier that the pop increase is 1.22 meters from the stumps. So there's a small stride that the batter got in. Uh, uh, the point of impact is probably about 1.5 meters from the stumps. So this ball still needs to travel approximately 1.5 meters. So do you think this would have gone on to hit the stumps, looking at weight pitch, looking at the angle, looking at the traveling distance? I don't think this would have gone on to hit the stumps. I agree with this. I think this is missing off stump. So these are all the clues uh, that you need to take into account when considering an LBW uh, appeal. This one, where did it pitch? Did it pitch outside off stump or between wicket and wicket? Yes, it pitched outside off stump. Where was the impact? Yes, the impact was between the wicket and wicket. Would it have gone on to hit the stumps? Looking at where the ball pits, looking at how much it came back, looking at the stride that the batter got in, probably need to travel an another 1.5 meters. I think this is, <laughs> excuse me, missing leg. Where did it pitch? Did it pitch outside off stump or between wicket and wicket? Yes, it pit pits outside off stump. Where was the impact? Was it between wicket and wicket? Yes, the impact was between wicket and wicket. Would it have gone on to hit the stumps? I don't think so. Why don't I think so? Look at how high the bat, uh, 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 the ball hit on the pad. I think this is going over the top. Again, it's a judgment call. Uh, LBW is an opinion law. If in your opinion, this would have gone on to hit the stumps, you give the striker out. But in my opinion, uh, looking at where it pits, where it hit, I think it's going over uh, the top. The penultimate law that I'm covering this evening before handing over to Tom. Stumped. All batsmen fear being stumped and all wicket keepers dream of stumping batsmen. So let's be clear about the law. The only player who can stump a batsman is this fellow, the wicket keeper. A stumping can take place provided that the ball is not a no ball. You can be stumped off a wide, however. Here, for example, the batsman has moved out of his or her ground to play the ball, but has missed it and has not attempted a run. The wicket is fairly put down by the wicket keeper without the intervention of another fielder. When all these conditions are met, the batsman will find that he or she has indeed been stumped. It's also okay for the ball to rebound onto the stumps off any part of the wicket keeper, including his or her protective equipment or helmet. If it is a no ball, the batsman will not be outstumped and is also protected from being run out as long as he or she is not attempting a run. Don't be stumped about stumping. Get a copy of the Blue Book and study Law 39. One thing I just want to highlight from the stump video. So, striker can be outstumped if the ball ricochets from any part of the keeper's person, including protective equipment, including the helmet. Last law that I'm covering for this evening is the timeout law. So, when, when it comes to timeout, incoming batter must be ready 
to receive the next call within three minutes of the dismissal or the retirement. Needs to be ready to receive the ball within three minutes of the dismissal. Tom, that is my portion for this evening. Thank you so much. I'm now handing over to you. Thank you very much, Abdullah, and good evening to all the candidates. We are into the final stretch of the course. And this, I would say, is as important as what Abdullah has just taken us through in terms of the revision lectures. So what are we going to do this evening? We are going to find out what is the plan going forward from here on in until you get your hands on that certificate, which is Cricket South Africa's level one umpiring certificate. I'm going to share with you my screen. And firstly, we're going to look at the timetable from now until the end of the exam. So today is Tuesday, the 29th of August, and our lecture will be completed at 8 p.m., after which we will take questions and answers from the floor. Uh, those of you who are wanting to attempt the exam need to pay an exam fee and the deadline for that payment is Sunday the 3rd of September at 1800 hours South African time. The exam fees differ depending on where you are. It's 300 rands for anyone in South Africa and it's 30 US dollars for candidates outside of South Africa. Payment details are on the emails that I have been sending you with the recordings of the lectures. Please scroll down on those emails and you will see you can either make an electronic funds transfer if you're in South Africa or pay using PayPal if you are outside of South Africa. If you do not have PayPal, please find a friend or family member or colleague who can pay on your behalf and then you can refund them that money. Very importantly, exam links will only be sent to email addresses who have sent their proofs of payment to training at wpcua.co.za. Uh, I do not have access to Western Province Cricket Umpires Association's bank account, so I cannot see who has paid unless you send a proof of payment to training at wpcua.co.za. Uh, one person may pay for more than him or herself. If you do pay for multiple candidates, please make sure that when you forward that proof of payment to me, you include the email addresses of who you are paying for. So if you're paying for 10 candidates, please list the email addresses of those 10 candidates when you forward the proof of payment. Uh, quite often people send automated proofs of payment from their bank straight to training at wpcua.co.za. Uh, that does not really help me because I don't know who that proof of payment is for. Yes, you might put your name in the reference, but I need your email address because exam link emails are sent to email addresses. OK, there might be more than uh, one John on this course. So if you just put your name John in the reference of the payment and you don't uh, send me your email address. I don't know which John to send the exam link email to. So that all needs to happen between now and Sunday, the 3rd of September. And what I'll do is uh, every night between now and Sunday, the 3rd of September, I will send an email to everyone uh, listing all the email addresses that have been paid for. 
So that way I am acknowledging your payments. And uh, thank you to all of those who have already paid. Uh, because of the number of payments that I'm expecting will come in over the next few days, I might not have the time to reply and thank each of you individually. Um, I will do so at the end of every day, listing your email addresses. Um, so thank you. Please don't be offended if I don't reply individually to you, all of your emails. So that takes place between now and Sunday. And then what happens on Monday? Monday, the 4th of September at 8 a.m. South African time is the start of the window period for the exam. It's a 10 day window period. So you are able to attempt up to five times to achieve the pass mark of 80% any time from Monday the 4th of September to Thursday the 14th of September. And we will be going through a click by click demonstration of how to register for the exam, log into the exam and start the exam and answer questions. So that is the purpose of uh, tonight's session with me. There are 69 true or false and multiple choice questions in the exam. And please note that if you get 55 out of 69, it is 79.67%. Unfortunately, that is not rounded up to 80%. You need to get 56 out of 69 to get 80 percent and obviously anything more than that is also a pass. The results are displayed instantaneously on your screen when you have submitted all of your answers. Just be careful you only have 90 minutes to answer all of those 69 questions. After 90 minutes if you have not completed your 69 questions the system will submit only those answers that you have completed and your exam will be marked accordingly. If and when you achieve 80% or more, your certificate will be emailed to me immediately and I will, as soon as I have the chance, forward it to your email address. Please note that if you complete and pass your exam at 2 a.m. South African time, I will not be up to forward your certificate two minutes later. Uh, I commit to sending your certificates within 12 hours of you passing. Note that once you pass, you will not get more attempts to improve your marks. So if you pass at your first attempt and you get 81%, uh, that's it. The system won't allow you any further attempts. If you get below 80%, you will have more attempts. Some people try to rush into their next attempt. I would advise against that because your brain will be frazzled after an hour or 90 minutes worth of true or falsing. Uh, you will see some of the questions are a little bit tricky especially those with uh, double negatives in the sentence. So please, you've got 10 days in total for up to five attempts. Do not rush into the next attempt. I would say take a break, uh, maybe sleep on it the next day. Go through Abdullah's thorough presentation of the revision slides and then attempt the exam again with a fresh mind. At the end of the exam period, so that is going to be Thursday night, the 14th of September, when everybody has had a chance to attempt the exam. I will send all passes, details of umpires associations closest to them, so that you may apply with the umpires association closest to you to join them and start umpiring if you are not already part of an umpires association. 
We do have contacts all around the world with uh, umpires and umpire administrators all around the world. Um, so when I send you your certificate, I will ask you where you are based and you need to reply to me as soon as possible so that if we don't have contact with the umpires association closest with you, closest to you, we will make a plan to research and find out who the contact people are and they will all contacts will be listed on that email to all the passes on Thursday night, the 14th of September. Uh, so please, a lot of people in the past see umpires association contact details listed on the last day of the window period and then only they say hey by the way i am in melbourne australia please give me the contact details of the umpires association closest to me um let us follow due process and make sure that when i send you your certificate you reply immediately to say i am based in melbourne australia or mumbai india i would like uh, the contact details of the umpires association closest to me last but not least in terms of admin details um, a lot of you i'm sure will want to do level two and level three with us you're most welcome. Our next level two will be online and it will start in May 2024. You do not have to do anything as long as you've passed level one. You'll be on our database for our mailing list of level two and three courses. And you will receive a detailed email about level two 10 days before the first level two online lecture. Right, so now let's go into a click by click demonstration of how to register, log in, and start an online exam. So this will be you on Monday morning or any time during the window period that you decide to attempt the exam. You will receive an email and that email will be listed or that email will be sent at 8 a.m on monday the 4th of september and it will not come from me although i generate the exam link emails the emails come from umpires universe academy okay and the subject will be you have been enrolled in a course and it will say it won't say introduction to umpiring it will say level one umpiring course um, today we are going to do a mock exam of the introduction to umpiring exam which has questions that are similar to the level one exam but of course not exactly the same as the questions you will get in the level one exam. So when you receive this email on Monday, the 4th of September, you need to, the, the big red button in the middle, which everybody usually uh, tries to click on, is not what you need to click on. You need to go and click on register because you cannot log in unless you have registered. Okay, so the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to register, then we're going to log in, and then we're going to start the exam. So step number one, register. And of course, you only need to register once, even if you're going to attempt the exam more than once, you don't need to register more than once. Right, so the email address that I'm using for tonight's demonstration is, and, and this needs to be the email address that the exam link email has been sent to, okay? Training. At 
wpcua.co.za. And I'm going to type in a password. And you need to always confirm that password. And click on I agree to the terms of use. And just need to make 100% sure that I typed in the correct email address. And it will tell me if my passwords don't match, but I'm sure they do. So then I click on sign in, sign up. But I need at least one alphanumeric character so my password is not strong enough let me try a different one and we go sign up so my my keyboard doesn't work so well so sometimes i type in a letter and it types it twice so I just need to be very careful when I generate this password. Okay, hopefully that works. Oh uh, dear, still not. Okay, let me just be very precise about this. M A A, yeah, my A is the problematic one. Uh, let me see if I can beat the system here by copying and pasting. <laughs> no, I can't. Start again. Okay. I'm just going to count the characters in each one to make sure they're the same. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Unfortunately, it doesn't show you. You can't view the passwords to verify that they're the same. Hopefully this time they do match. Looks like it's going through. Apologies for that delay. User created, please check your email. So, as with most signups, you need to confirm your sign up. Okay, so I'm going back into my email and it normally comes through quite quickly. So, I'm just going to uh, log out of my emails and uh, log back into the emails. OK. And I'm going to refresh. There we go. So it, it took about two minutes to come through from the time that I registered and signed up, it says confirm your email. And once again, it's from Umpires University Academy. Uh, just check if you do not receive the exam link email on Monday morning, check your spam folder or your junk folder. It does sometimes end up there. And the confirmation email has also at times gone to my spam or junk folders. So uh, just check those as well, please. So. Not much to go through here, just to click on confirm account. Then it takes us to the login page and it tells us that our account has been verified. And remember that this email address needs to be the same one that you typed in first up and that the exam link email was sent to. 
Um, so now let me hopefully not struggle with this password again. Log in. So we've successfully registered our account. We've confirmed our account. Now we are logging in to the exam system. And yours on Monday morning will not be blue. It will be green and it will say level one umpiring course. OK, so just remember that. Then you click on uh, view course. And this is where you, we will now fill in all our details before we start writing the exam. Please update profile details before taking any test. And again, you'll only have to do this once. You won't have to do it for every exam attempt. So um, quite important, full name, which will appear on your certificate. So don't put your nickname, don't put your wife's name, don't put um, what your friends call you, put the full name that you want to appear on the certificate. Uh, date of birth, if you try and scroll on here, it will take you forever to get to your date of birth, except especially if you're old like me. So you need to click on the month. Uh, sorry, uh, next, when you hover over the year, then you are able to scroll through the years a lot quicker than if you were scrolling uh, on the left as I was through the months. So once you get to your year, then you can scroll through to the month and select your day. Uh, race, gender, city, put in whatever city you are in, uh, whether it's Mumbai, whether it is uh, Dar es Salaam, wherever you are. Uh, province is only South African provinces are here. Uh, so if you are not, if you're outside of South Africa, uh, please put Western Cape. If you are anywhere else in South Africa, yes, do select your your province. OK. Uh, if you are not in Western Cape, but you are in any other province in South Africa, yes, you may select your province. OK, I'm going to select Western Cape. And for everyone else who is not in South Africa, please select Western Cape. OK. Cool. Now we save changes. Please make sure that you have a good Internet connection. Otherwise, um, you're going to struggle in the exam to go from one question to the next and you might run out of time. So now uh, my profile has been updated and I am ready to go to my exam. Uh, you would think that you click on current test, but no, it's actually my courses that you need to go to. And it's the same page that we started off at. And this time when we click on view course, we won't have the details to fill in that we just did. We are going to be able to start the exam. And I'm going to ask uh, Abdullah to facilitate the um, introduction to umpiring exam has got 35 questions. So Abdullah, hopefully there's still 35 uh, candidates or more in the meeting room and they are all going to help us to answer these 35 questions. So no need to go to FAQs, no need to watch 
this video. You can if you want to. Uh, take note of the time. The time limit for this exam is only 30 minutes. And um, if we do not get through the 35 questions in 30 minutes, we'll see what happens when we run out of time. But we are now going to click on take test. And again, these questions are not exactly what you're going to get in your level one exam, but they are similar. So this will give you an idea of the level of difficulty um, and also the wording of the exams. So uh, good practice for us to get used to before next week, Monday. Right. Uh, the last thing that you need to do is to click on agree to the terms of use, but also select your provincial association. Now, this is the most important step of the registration process. This lists all the umpires associations in South Africa. And wherever you are in South Africa, please pick Western Province. And wherever you are in the world, please select Western Province. If you select any of the other provinces or any other of the other associations, your certificate will not be emailed to me. It will be emailed to the head of training of the association that you click on. So please, ladies and gentlemen, if you remember anything from tonight's presentation, is that when it comes to your selecting your provincial association, all of you, and I mean all of you, wherever you are in South Africa and wherever you are in the world, select Western Province. If you do not select Western Province, your certificate will go to somebody else and I won't forward it to you and you'll complain that I promised I would send your certificate within 12 hours of you passing and I haven't sent it to you. Why? Because I didn't receive it. Okay, let's start test. As I mentioned, um, Good idea to get a good internet connection. I've got a pretty good internet connection, uh, but you can see that the system is quite slow. What I'm going to do is I'm going to close all other um, items that I don't need open. So, Abdullah, we're going to go through the um, meeting room and I need 35 volunteers one at a time to take me through these questions. Uh, umpires are the sole judges of fair and unfair play. Uh, do we have any hands up? Is that true or false? Please, can we have a volunteer to unmute and give us their answer? Uh, yes, Tom, first hand to the race was Mohammed. Mohammed, can you unmute your microphone and give us the answer, please, Mohammed? Yeah, yes, that's true. That is true, Mohammed, and I hope uh, you are taking note of this session. You did call me after last week's lecture uh, asking what the exam is all about. Uh, you're seeing it live. Um, it does take a while to submit and go to the next question. Um, so good idea is to make up your mind quickly and then go on to the next question. Uh, thanks, Mohammed. We'll chat later. Question two. Captains are responsible for their team's conduct. True or false? Any new hands, please, Abdullah. Captains are responsible for the team's conduct. Yes, Tom, lots of new hands, but I'll go to number one um, in the queue. And I hope I'm pronouncing this name correctly. Uh, Ratchet Kirkiri. Can you unmute your microphone and give us the answer, please? Yeah, it's true. Uh, that is true. And we're going to go and submit. Uh, what you will also notice is that your timer is here the whole time, counting down on um, this exam. It started at 30 minutes and will go down to zero. In the level one exam, it will start at 90 minutes and will go down to zero. Next question. 
it is not against the spirit of the game to dispute an umpire's decision. And this is where you need to be careful with these true or false questions when you are given a negative statement. It is not against the spirit of the game to dispute umpire's decisions. Abdullah, new hand, please. And those of yes, you, we have a new uh, hand. Please mute your microphone. Um, Abdullah, uh, the new hand can unmute. Uh, Sharon, can you unmute your microphone and provide us with the answer, please, Sharon? Oh, my answer is false. Uh, that's correct, Sharon. I agree with that. Um, it is a negative statement. It is not against the spirit of the game to dispute an umpire's decision. That is false. It is against the spirit of the game to dispute an umpire's decision. Uh, Sharon, I've been following you on Facebook. Very busy with your umpiring there in Uganda. Keep it up and all the best for the exam uh, coming up. Next question. Thank you so much. <laughs> You're welcome. Number four, teams are allowed to distract opponents verbally. Abdullah, next candidate, please. Number one in the queue, Tom uh, Sentil. False. False. False Sentil. Thank you very much for all of your participation over the last three and a half weeks. I'm sure you'll do well in the exam. All the best. And uh, while the um, answer is being submitted, candidates are also welcome, those who have answered the question, to give um, any general comment on the uh, course and the um, presentations that we have given over the last three and a half weeks. Next question, a team can field with 12 players. Abdullah, true or false? Next hand, please. Number one in the queue, uh, Ken, can you unmute your microphone and provide us with the answer, please, Ken? Ken, please unmute uh, your microphone. Uh, uh, Ken, are you able to unmute your microphone? Doesn't look like it, Tom. I'll Let's give him one, two more seconds. Uh, doesn't look like it. Um, let's go to next in the queue. Uh, Edgar, can you please unmute your microphone and provide us with the answer, please? Hi, everyone. Uh, the answer is false. Edgar, that is, I believe, correct. Uh, we're submitting. Uh, any I comments so. <laughs> on the course and the exam? Are you happy? Are you excited? <clears throat> Yeah, I'm happy, excited. I just sent you my proof of payment. <laughs> Lovely, Edgar. Really excited. Thank you very much. All the best Thanks, for you. Guys. You're welcome. Thank you. Next question. Umpires before the toss do not need to determine the times of play. True or false? Subtila, next hand, please. Yeah, I'm looking for new hands because I'm going to give those uh, an opportunity that hasn't answered before. So, mm -hmm. next hand race is uh, Giris Throwade. Can you please unmute your mic and provide us with the answer? Uh, hi. So, I think the answer is false. I agree with you, Girish. Uh, umpires do need to determine the times of play at the toss. So I'm submitting false on your behalf. Thank you. Any, any comments on the course? So today is my first lecture, actually. It was actually okay. good. I find it really uh, informative. Great stuff. I hope you watch the rest of the lectures on our YouTube channel and all the best for the exam, Kirish. Sure, sure. Next question, bowlers and umpire to stand anywhere he feels comfortable. Now, what's important with these true or false questions 
if a statement is not 100% true, then you need to mark it false. Like Abdullah said earlier, when an umpire moves from square leg to point, he needs to inform three people. So if they only list one person, then it is not 100% true. So you mark it false. Abdullah, do we have a candidate for this statement to answer true or false, please? Yes, Tom, I'm giving the uh, new, uh, new attendees an opportunity that hasn't answered yet. Afak Alam, can you please unmute your microphone and provide us with the answer, please? Hi, Abdullah, sir. Hi, Tom. How are you doing? Hello, Afak. Good, Good thing. Yeah, sir, I think it's uh, true. Uh, the umpire can stand anywhere to feel comfortable, to give the decision, I guess. Okay, remember what I've just said, Afak. Um, if a statement is not 100% correct, 100% uh, true, then you need to mark it false. Uh, because, yes, this is correct, but there are further requirements of where the bowlers and umpire needs to stand um, over and above where he, he or she feels comfortable. So do you want to revise that answer? Okay, so then it is false, right? Then it would be false, yes. Afak, I've seen you on quite a few lectures. Uh, any uh, questions or comments? Um, any advice how we can improve our course for future lectures? Yeah, so it is very, very, you know, um, like uh, worthful for me. Uh, I learn a lot. Mm. And uh, I'll continue my level two and level three with you guys. If I'll pass level one, inshallah. Great. Great stuff, Afak. I'm sure we'll <laughs> see you at level two next year. Uh, next question or next statement. Dead ball signal is made by extending both arms horizontally. Dead ball signal. Abdullah, next new hand, please. Uh, Abid Patel. Abit, I see your microphone is on mute. Uh, yeah, we can hear you, Abit. Can you give us the answer, please? It's true. Uh, is that your signal for uh, dead ball, Abit? Dead ball signal, but it's certainly both arms. Yeah, it's true. Um. I don't think that's true a bit. In fact, I'm quite sure it's not true. <laughs> uh, dead ball, if you remember from our first lecture, dead ball signal is that. Um, and what the um, what the statement here is describing is that this is the wide ball signal that has been described. So do you want to give us a different answer? Okay. Yeah, thanks a bit. All the best for the exam. I hope you've enjoyed. I hope you've enjoyed the lectures, and um, good luck for the level one exam coming up next week. <clears throat> right. Uh, next question. An umpire may signal four buys in one motion to the scorers. So um, can you do that and that at the same time? True or false? Abdullah, next hand up, please. Yeah, lots of hands, but I'm giving the opportunity to those that, that did not answer yet. Patience, can you please unmute your microphone and give us the answer? Good day, everyone. My Hello, answer person. is true. Hello, can you hear me? Hello? Yes, patients, Hello? we can hear you loud and clear. 
Uh, in the first Hello. lecture, Abdul, Ab Abdullah told us that signals need to be made separately. So what this um, statement is saying is that we can signal buys and for at the same time. Is that true or is that yes. false? True. It okay. is true. They are two different signals. They need to be made separately, one after the other. So the correct way would be to signal buys, get acknowledgement from the scorers, and then signal oh, boundary you. four, and then get four. acknowledgement for um, boundary from the scorers. So do you want to revise your answer? Yes, it is false. Thank you, patience. All the best for the Thanks. level one exam. Any um, feedback from your side as to how you've enjoyed the course? Uh, I've enjoyed the course so far. Though I've been in cricket for some time, but I left cricket to another sport. So to bring myself back, I had to start from the basics. That's what I'm, I put in for the course. And so far, I have enjoyed myself at the comfort of my home. That's very important. Great. Welcome back to Cricket Patience and all the best for the exam. Next question. Next statement. The pitch length is the same for all ages. Abdullah, true or false? Next hand up, please. I'm going through the list and I'm giving those an opportunity that hasn't answered yes uh, yet. Um, Rohan, can you unmute your microphone and provide us with the answer, please? Yeah, thanks, Abdullah. Hi, Tom. Uh, so the answer from me is false. That's correct. It is different for youth matches and guided by the governing body of that country as to the length of pitches for youth matches. Rohan, thank you so much. Have you enjoyed the course? Are you looking forward to the level one exam? Yes, I have enjoyed the course. Actually, this is also my first live lecture, but I have gone through all the recordings and it was wonderful to uh, get the knowledge from both you and Abdullah. And hopefully in some years down the line, maybe if I come, I'll, uh, come there to South Africa, then maybe I'll get an opportunity to umpire with you. Awesome, you're most welcome, Rohan. All the best for the level one exam. Next Thank statement, a, a change of innings will be classified as an interval. True or false, Abdullah? Next hand up, please. Uh, Nagali, can you unmute your microphone and provide us with the answer, please? please. Sir, it's true, sir. That is true. A uh, change of innings is definitely classified as an interval. Nagali, have you enjoyed the course? Are you writing the exam next yes, week? Sir. Yes, sir. I'm writing the exam. Excellent. Uh, I am from India, sir. I took a course with the CSR, sir. I beg your pardon, Nagali. Please repeat. I took a course from with Sriharsha, sir, from India, sir. Okay. Did you know Sri Harsha, well. sir? Yes, I do know Harsha very well. Uh, yes. Thank you yes, sir. for thank joining you. our course. Next statement. Thank you, sir. Bowlers and umpire to call play after any interval or interruption. True or false, Abdullah? Next new hand, please. Next hand is... Brendan Jonathan. Wafi, welcome. <laughs> oh, good evening, everyone. Um, Hello, yeah. Brendan. Can I just repeat? Uh, good evening, everyone. How are you guys? Very well, can thank you. Yeah, very well, thanks, uh, Wafi. Okay. How are you? Thanks. Uh, yeah. I'm all good, thanks, man. Um, it's my first time joining the meeting. So yeah, I'm looking forward to write the exam as well. Um, can you just repeat the question, um, Tom? 
The bowler's end umpire must call play after any interval or interruption. True or false? That's true. 100 percent uh Wofi, this is a man with uh probably uh more years of umpiring than uh, you or i abdullah so uh well done brendan thank you for joining us <laughs> thanks thank you thanks thanks cheers Wofi. keep our chat soon okay thanks likewise next statement is a striker may set off for a run from in front of the popping crease. True or false? A striker may set off for a run from in front of the popping crease. Meaning which he or she does not need to go back if they are batting outside of the popping crease. They do not go back into their popping crease before they run to the other side of the pitch. True or false, Abdullah, any new hands? Yeah, there's lots of hands, but I'm giving the, the new attendees opportunities. Uh, Gavin, your hand is raised. Can you unmute your microphone, please, Gav? Uh, hi, can you hear me? Loud and clear, Gav, go ahead. Okay, that's true. He can, he can, he, he, he can, he can take on the run without going back into the popping crease. 100%, Gav, well done. I'm sure you'll do well in the level one exam. I've seen you in many of our lectures. Yeah. Have you enjoyed the course? <laughs> yeah, I can't wait. I can't wait for the exam. <laughs> Good man. Uh, excited to have Thanks you. Thanks a lot, board. guys. It's been awesome. Uh, yeah, no, it's been awesome, man. Eh? You're welcome. Thank you for joining us. Next statement. Okay, Umpires man. do not need to agree the boundaries with the captains. True or false, any new hands, please, Abdullah? Uh, Grace, can you unmute your microphone and provide us with the answer, please? please. Uh, good evening, Abdullah. Uh, good evening, Tom. Uh, the answer would be false, because I think uh, the umpires and the captains have to agree on uh, the boundaries before the game. I agree with you, Grace. You're welcome. Thank uh, you very any much, feedback Tom. on the course? Uh, it's been nice. It's been. Uh, I've not been able to attend. Uh, this is my first uh, time attending, okay. but I've gone through some of the some of the YouTube uh, uh, captions and then. Um, from you, and then um, yeah, it's been good. It's been it's been great. Thank you very much. You're welcome, Grace. All the best for the exam. Next statement. Thank you. Thank the, you. The ball becomes dead when it lodges in the clothing of an umpire. True or false? Abdullah, next new hand, please. Yeah, next new and uh, Tom is Kolili Mabuza. Hi, I think the answer is false here. The ball becomes dead when it lodges in the clothing of an umpire. That is a good question. Um, if it lodges in the clothing of the striker, yes. If it lodges in the clothing of a fielder, no. If it lodges in the clothing of an umpire, Abdullah, please give us your expert opinion on this one. Well done, Tolile. It is. Did she say true? I think she said. Uh, she, she said false, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, I'm getting old. Uh, uh, yeah, <laughs> it, it, it becomes dead when it lodges in the clothing of the umpire. That is uh, true, Olile. Tricky one. Um, how have you enjoyed the course so far? Anything we can improve on, in your opinion? 
Now, I think uh, for me, uh, it was amazing. I can't speak for <laughs> the rest of the class, but it was amazing. It was mind blowing and very much eye opening. I've been like uh, trying to make my way in the cricket <laughs> space as a commentator and I've never played the sport, so I've like only yeah. learned the sport from watching and reading books. So this like cause really like got me into the things I've been watching and what is really happening. So I'm really impressed. Okay, Polile, thanks for the feedback. Um, as we mentioned in one of the lectures, um, the International Cricket Council, as well as Cricket South Africa, is looking for female umpiring umpires. Uh, there's a lot of opportunities for females in the umpiring space. Uh, so please, um, commentating is boring. You want to be in the middle of the game, involved in every ball. Uh, do the level one umpiring exam with us and uh, the sky's the limit. Thank you for joining Thank us. All you. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Uh, I'm, I'm rushing through these questions now because we've only got seven minutes left. The next statement, a bowler may change his or her delivery mode without informing the umpire. Abdullah, I think you covered that one in the no ball law. Uh, any new hands, true or false, please? Surad, can you unmute your microphone and provide us with the answer, please? Yeah, hi all, good evening. The answer is false as the bowler has to inform the umpire before changing the mode of delivery every time. Well, that's Suraj, 100%. And uh, I've seen you as well in quite a few of our lectures, Suraj. Uh, any comments or feedback for us? Have you enjoyed the course? I thoroughly enjoyed and just uh, no feedback because you have been doing well and I'm sure this this will be going on for a long time. I really like the way you narrated with the videos and your uh, material is really helpful with a lot of information, videos. Yeah, cheers, cheers to your hard work that goes in the background. Thanks for the positive comments, Suraj. Next statement, bowler's back foot may touch the return crease on delivery. Abdullah covered this just today in the revision slides. True or false, please, Abdullah? Any new hands? Yeah, Abhishek, can you please unmute your microphone and provide us with the answer? It's false. Uh, it is false if a fielder's back foot, uh, sorry, if a bowler's back foot touches the return crease, it shall be a no ball. Abhishek, any no. feedback from you on the course? Hope you've enjoyed it. Yeah, uh, definitely I'm enjoying. Uh, looking forward to attend the exam. All the best for the exam, Abhishek. Thanks for joining us for the course. Thank, thank you. Next statement, the call of no ball shall override the call of wide. True or false? Next hand, please. Dula. Next, new and Tosif. Tosif, can can you? Yeah, I see you unmuted. Can you provide us with the answer, please, Tosif? True. Uh, that is true, Tosif. Very well spotted. Yes. Any comments from your side about the course? Hope you've enjoyed it. I enjoyed it very well, and you guys are doing wonderful, wonderful job. You can help us a lot. In which I just started the umpiring recently. They will help me a lot. Thank you, guys. You must keep this doing as long as you can do. Will do. Thanks for the feedback, Tosef. Next statement, the umpire to call wide before the ball passes the striker's wicket. Abdullah mentioned this this evening. Any new hands? True or false, please, Abdullah? Uh, yes, we have a new hand. Najwa Omar. 
Can you unmute hey. your microphone? Evening all. Um, so the answer is false. That's correct, Nalwa. We need to wait until the ball is past the striker's wicket before we call wide. Uh, tell us, as a uh, parent of a cricket player, have we improved your knowledge of the laws in this course? Significantly. Um, I, like I said, is I can't wait for the season to start. Um, mm. And very informative. I think um, actually the players should be attending these courses as well in order for them to understand the laws and also to respect the umpires when making a decision. So um, that is why, I, like I said, I'm doing it. So I won't be doubting Abdullah anymore when he, made it, <laughs> when he makes a decision. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Thank, our next Thank you, guys. You're welcome. Our next uh, online level one will be towards the end of November. Please, if you can tell all the players on your child's team to join the course, including your child, that would be much appreciated. Tom, just a secret. Um, mm. Nobody actually knows that I'm doing the course besides my son. So okay. um, when I do take the, when I, the season starts, I will be showing them my certificates. Don't worry. Do that. <laughs> um, I just want to know if there's something else of me um, recruiting, recruiting some of them. I'll re definitely recruit some of them to do the course. That would be great. Thank you so much, Najwa. Okay. Thank you. All the best. Next statement a batter can be dismissed from a wide delivery true or false any new hands Dula? um uh, yeah i see a new hand uh, simon uyugi yes uh, uh, good evening everyone hello Simon. Hi, Simon. yes uh yes hello yes are you Go getting ahead. me hello yeah loud and clear simon yeah yeah, I think the answer is uh, it's true. That is true, Simon. Thank you so much. Uh, Thank you very much. Any any feedback from you in terms of the course? I think I've yes, seen you a couple of times I'm, in the lectures. Yes, I've been enjoying so much from the, hmm. from the day when it started. I've been enjoying and following. Sometimes I could watch through the YouTube. Awesome. And I want to thank all of you for having been there for us. You are most welcome. Thank you very Simon. much. All the best for the exam. Right, Abdullah, I think thank this is going to be the last statement that we submit an answer for. A leg buy can be scored if the batter does not attempt to play the ball. If a batter shoulders arms and the ball hits his or her pad and it goes towards fine leg, will they be allowed to run? Will we award leg buys? Any new hand up, Dula? No, Tom, I don't see a new hand. Although there are 11 hands raised, let's just give mm. it one or two more seconds. I don't think we have one or two more seconds. Uh, mm -hmm. Looking at the town gun clock, I see a new end, uh, Mayor Goil. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, the, the, yes, yes, sir. The answer is false. The answer is false. Uh, leg buys will not be awarded if a batter did not attempt to play the ball. So, um, before we submit this last answer, uh, any feedback from your side on the course? Uh, sir, uh, my feedback is uh, very helpful for me, your course, and uh, uh, I am uh, getting very much knowledge from you. You guys uh, very, uh, uh, very talented for uh, giving us a very uh, grateful knowledge. Thank you, sir. Awesome. You are so welcome, and I'm glad we are reaching all corners of the cricketing world. So let's see what happens when we submit an answer after our time has expired. 
Remember that in the level one exam, you've got 90 minutes to answer 69 questions. And please make sure that your internet connection is good so that uh, it takes uh, as little time as possible between answers after you submit. Uh, but the reason that it does take some time when you click on submit is because the answer is being marked as you click on submit. So we click on submit now. Our time is over, so we won't be allowed to attempt any further questions. We've only attempted 21. And it says, sorry, your time is up. Please submit your results. It shows you uh, the answers that you have submitted and tells us that we haven't completed quite a few of the questions. Uh, and just so you know, if you do attempt the exam more than once, it will be the same 69 questions, but they will be in a different order to the first time or the second time or the third time or the fourth time that you attempted it. So every single attempt, the questions are jumbled up. And so if you sit next to someone when you're doing your exam, who's also doing their exam, you won't see the same questions at the same time because they are displayed in random order. OK, so we have submitted 21 answers. Let us see what our results are. Get results. 30 out of 35, I think would be 80%. Let's check. Uh, that would be 86%. Um, for 35, you need 28, so we obviously did not pass. We got 54%. So 54% um, of 35, we got 19 questions correct, so we actually got two questions incorrect. Obviously, the ones that we did not attempt, we got incorrect. And then two that we attempted, we also got incorrect. Um, the some of these answers uh, we do actually not agree with. Um, also on the level one exam, um, but as long as you know your material that we have covered, uh, you will be able to get eighty percent for your exam. So that's our failed result. As you can see, the restart button is right there for you to go straight into the exam, but I do not suggest that. I suggest you take a break, have a sleep, wake up the next day, go through Abdullah's uh, revision uh, lecture, and I will be sending those slides um, later tonight to all of you along with the recording of this lecture. Uh, so you can actually, if you want to, sit with those slides on one device while you do your exam on another device. You can do this exam on a mobile phone. You can do it on a um, iPad or a tablet. You can do it on a laptop or a desktop computer. Entirely up to you. Um, it is not as easy to do it on a mobile phone, but it is possible. Uh, one of our trainers here in Cape Town has done it on a uh, phone and it is possible, but those pictures, for example, of the leg before wicket um, dismissal decisions that you need to judge on, uh, won't be easy to see on a mobile phone. So I would advise you to rather do it on a tablet or a computer um, for easier viewing purposes. And as mentioned, if you do not pass on your first attempt, then uh, please take a break and come back again on a next attempt. And how you can do a next attempt is if you go to your email that you got on the Monday the 4th, 
of September. Then you, because you've already registered, then you can go to the very first email and you from there you can click on login okay remember that before you attempt the exam for the first time you need to register but if you are going to attempt for a second or a third or a fourth time then you can simply click on login You've already got your username, which is your email address. Um, you've already got your password. Let's see if it's the right password that's in there. Yes, it is. And then it will come up to a green page, which is level one exam. And if you click on view course, because you've already registered, because you've already filled in all your details for the exam, you don't need to go through all of that again. You simply go to take test on the screen. OK. So that is how you would. Register, log in, fill in your details and then start the exam and take the exam submit your answers, get your results, and if you have not passed on your first attempt, I'm now showing you how you would uh, go about your subsequent attempts. And the next time you come here, it will have your provincial association as Western Province. Please remember not to pick any other association and then you click on start test and you will go through your test again. So I hope that has shown all of you how to navigate through uh, the exam. I will now be unsharing my screen and we shall go into the chat box to discuss any questions that have not been uh, addressed so far. I just can't seem to get to my. Uh, I think it's over here. There we go. Stop sharing. Right. Uh, we've still got a lot of hands up. Are those hands uh, wanting to answer uh, questions 36 to uh, 70? Uh, that's all the question answering we're going to have for today in terms of uh, mock exam. Uh, Afak, you've got your hand up. Is that to ask a question to us, please? Unmute your microphone. The floor is yours. Yeah, hi Tom. Uh, I just wanted to ask you the the uh, payment we have to make like three of uh, third of September, right? Before third of Late. September, we pay. The latest will be third of September, six p.m. South African time. Please, uh, you can make it right now if you wish. Uh, but yes, the deadline is Sunday, the third of September. Okay. Cool. Thank you so Thanks. much. There. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Simon, you've got your hand up. Is that an old hand or do you have a question to ask, please? I wanted to, the, okay. The question was about the terms of payment. Mm. Yeah. So the way you said, you said we can use any, anyone who knows about the system, can be our relative, our brother. Can you help us in that way of paying? Yes, uh, it's an online payment gateway called PayPal. And uh, it's really simple. You use a credit card uh, to pay because your for, because, because Because for me, I'm in Uganda. Anybody around the world can use PayPal.com to make payments. Okay, thank you. 
Uh, on the email that I sent to you with uh, all the recordings of all the lectures, three quarters of the way down the page, there is a icon of the um, PayPal and uh, there you click on that icon and it will take you to the payment page. It's really very simple. Right, uh, next hand up is Ken. Ken, please unmute your microphone. The floor is yours. Ken, please unmute your microphone. Oh, hello guys I, I think i had a ahead. problem with my connectivity that's why i was uh when i raised my hand it was about the question which was going on before not this one okay yeah no uh, problem it was uh, like a motor like that huh? hello you get me yeah, yes i can hear you, hello, ken. you i'm gonna i'm gonna put your hand down ken thank you very much i raised my hand before uh, Thank you, Ken. All the best for the exam. Next hand up is uh, Tosef. Tosef, is that an old hand or have you got a question for us? He's on mute. Uh, I have one. Hi, how are you? I have yes. one question regarding regarding the nobles. Hmm. Uh, if if the bolus does the return crease before the non before the stump, can we should call a no ball or you can carry on? Sorry, before what, Joseph? Before the stump, the bowler, if it does the return crease, we should call no ball or is it fine? Before the wicket stump, non striker stump. The return crease if it's baller touch with the foot or front or back foot. Any foot if it's touch it, call no ball or it's fine. Abdullah, you want to take that one? You just need to guide me if, if I didn't hear his question properly, Tom. So my understanding is the bowler touches the return crease. So Tosif, as soon as that back foot touches the return crease, you need to call and signal no ball. So as soon as it touches, call and signal no ball. You want the before did I answer, the stump? Did, yes. did I answer your question, Tosif? Yes. Uh, before the it is to the prop increase. Hello? Uh, yeah, what about the prop increase, Tosif? Before the reach to the stomach, if it the touch the return crease behind the stomach, it also have to call the nobles. Yeah, anyway, if it touches that it, the return crease, those if you you need to call and signal noble. It doesn't have to be uh, past the, uh, the bowling crease. Uh, as, as long as the bowler is touching the return crease with, uh, with his or her back foot, you need to call and signal noble. Alright, thank you very much, Abdullah. Tom, yes, thanks welcome, very much. Alright, thank you. You're welcome, Tosif. Next hand up, uh, Nagali. Nagali, is that an old hand or do you have a question for us? So, uh, sir, we have we can pay through only PayPal or any other bank transaction service. Um, Nagali, uh, PayPal is the easiest one for us. Um, if you don't have access to PayPal or if you don't have um, anybody that has access to PayPal, uh, then you can use wise.com. Wise.com is um, a website that is um, helps with international wire transfers. Um, you will need uh, my bank account details. So do me a favor and um, 
send an email to training at wpcua.co.za and uh, you can ask uh, me for my bank account details and I will share those with you and you can use that to pay via wise.com. Okay. So is there any Google Pay like that? Uh, no, Nagali, we only use PayPal or wise.com. Uh, those are the two options for international payments. Okay, sir. I'll get back touch with you, sir. Yes, sir. All right. You're welcome. All the best. Thank you. Thank you. Next hand up is Rohan. Rohan, please unmute your microphone. The floor is yours. Yeah, thanks, Tom. Uh, so my question is related to the creases. Uh, so Abdullah mentioned that uh, for the creases, we have these measurements, which are in meters as well as in feet. Uh, so uh, for the exam, uh, when, when they ask, like for example, what is the length of the return crease or what is the length of the bowling crease? So should we answer in like both the meters and the feet or is any one of uh, the units is OK? So Rohan, remember that the exam is either true or false questions or multiple choice questions. And if it is a multiple choice question, they will list various lengths of, re of return creases or they'll list various measurements and the each um, option will have both the centimeters and the feet for you to choose from so uh, 3.66 meters i think is about 11 feet or 12 feet so you know if you see 3.66 meters slash 12 feet that is the correct answer to pick so you do not have to write anything you just select true or false or you select a b c or d i hope that answers your question ron yeah thank you thanks a lot awesome next hand up is girish girish please unmute your microphone the floor is yours yeah, hi. I, I actually have a question. As a matter of fact, I have a doubt regarding the questions we just discussed. Uh, mm -hmm. One question we discussed was uh, if this uh, if the ball is launched uh, within the clothing of the umpire, uh, whether the ball is dead or not, right? Mm -hmm. So we agreed uh, that uh, the ball becomes dead, but. Uh, Actually, I am having problem. I can't uh, find a statement in law book to support that answer. Can you please help me with that? Abdullah, I'm sure you can refer us to yeah. where uh, in law 20 that is mentioned. Uh, Girish, uh, yeah, go to law 20 um, under the section where it shows the ball automatically becomes dead. Uh, it is uh, either point number four or point number five where it, where it speaks about when it lodges in the clothing of a batsman or the clothing of the umpire that the ball automatically becomes dead. So it's either point four, five or six. Okay, okay. I, I will look for it. You're welcome, Girish. Yeah. Next time, yeah, and one more. Uh, one more question I have, and no. the bo one question we discussed that bowlers and umpire has to call uh, play, I guess, uh, after the interruption. So uh, were we talking about uh, starting of the interruption or uh, end of the interruption? What was the question like? Uh, end of the interruption. Uh Oh, so that, oh, okay. that's when pl play starts after rain break. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Got it, got it. Thank you. Great stuff. Uh, next hand up is uh, Mohammed from New York. Mohammed, please unmute your microphone. The floor is yours. 
Uh, yes, I have two questions here, but I'm um, one in reference of the test. In New York time, any time after 8 p.m., I could take the test or any specific time? Um, the exam link email, Mohammed, will be sent at 8 a.m. South African time. Uh, South Africa is six hours ahead of New York. So that will be 2 a.m. New York time. You will receive the exam link email on Monday, the 4th of September. So from then on, you are able to follow the steps that I have just demonstrated to register, log in, and start the exam. So in New York, around this time, I could take my test? Yes, definitely. On Monday, uh, at this time in New York, you will be able okay, to take um, your test. May I wait till you get back to me or I can ask a second question? You can ask your second question, Mohammed. Yeah, second question, Mr. Abdullah. Uh, it happened to me last week, but um, the bowler, my colleague, give the, you know, the bowler, you know, the bowler marker, okay, on his side, on the top end. So the other bowler came on my end I don't know this composition is steep. If I if I'm allowed to say this, I don't know. Uh, the bowler. Well, I will use this word so we we all know what this meant. Take out his his or her personal equipment. We you know we know what we're talking about the guard, and he said ump. You you gonna use this for his bowler run up? So I I said no, because I just don't want to waste time. Uh, but the last 28, the feeler, um, would that be considered, uh, Mr. Abdullah, that um, I did the right thing to stop him, you know, the bowler then, so to speak, not to use that because, as a matter of the fact, I don't want to waste time. The, the other bowler marker, you know, is on the top end with my colleague, then the other bowler. So I said, um, no, I cannot allow that because the ball, you know, touched that, you know, uh, you know, protective equipment, so to speak, with the internal equipment, um, you will be on the penalty. I will award five penalty runs to the batting side. In that situation, Mr. Tom, uh, Abdul, um, did I uh, go through the right procedure in that situation? But he did not get upset with me. You know, he respectfully, you know, put back his, you know, we all know we're talking, put back his stuff and get a piece of paper, whatever, and use it for the bowler marker. Um, I just want to know if this happens in the future, should we, if that's the right thing to do. Abdullah, did you understand the scenario? You're going to have to uh, help me analyze it, please, Tom. Or if you understood it, if you can answer him. I didn't hear what he, I, I couldn't visualize what Muhammad was trying to say. Uh, Muhammad, unfortunately, I also can't understand the scenario you're trying to paint as to what happened. We've, we've got Langton on the line as well. I don't know if Langton heard uh, the scenario. The scenario is not difficult. I, I th Good evening, everyone. I think I understood Sorry. what he was talking about. Thank you, Mr. Langton. If, how are you doing? Okay, fine. Well, Just, uh, focus on my understanding step. of what you were talking about is, well, I'll answer what I understand. You can't use any equipment or clothing to mark your bowler's run-up. Any discarded equipment or clothing, if the ball touches that discarded equipment or clothing, five penalty runs. So in my view, from what I understood, you did the right thing because one, you took a proactive approach to tell the bowler that they can't do that, and you then educated them on why they can't do that and the repercussions of them doing that. So I think that was brilliant of you. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Thanks, Langton. Good evening. And thanks, Mohammed, for the in always interesting scenarios. Uh, next hand up is Suraj. Suraj, please unmute your microphone. The floor is yours. Yeah, hi, Tom. Hi, Abdullah. Hi, Langton. So the question is around the exam. Um, if the connection is interrupted during the exam, Will it be considered as first attempt done? Uh, yes, it will be. 
Yes, Suraj, I've seen in the past where um, candidates have halfway through the exam experienced a power cut, their device switched off or their internet connection cut. And uh, unfortunately, that is the end of that attempt and it is registered as an attempt. So please ensure that you have got uninterrupted power supply and uninterrupted internet connectivity throughout the 90 minutes for your exam to go um, seamlessly. I hope that answers your question, Suraj. Oh, yes, Tom, that has. Yeah, it'll be extra full around that. And uh, yeah, nothing much. Yeah, good to hear from Langton. We missed him in the last session. <laughs> You know, Langton was very busy with somebody else uh, that previous uh, <laughs> call. Yeah. Um, so Raj, uh, just to expand on your point, um, if you don't, if you're not able, if your attempts are cut short, uh, then I am able to reset your account and you will be able to have five new attempts okay but uh, please try and make sure that you have uh, full internet con connectivity and also uninterrupted power supply during your attempts if you fail on all five of your attempts you are allowed to pay for um, another five attempts uh, you can all contact me uh, separately if that is the case and uh, I will guide you through the procedure for paying for more attempts but um, all of you very smart candidates I know will not need more than two attempts to pass the exam so uh, that shouldn't be an issue for you Suraj and the rest of the candidates tonight thank you yeah thanks for the information Tom yeah I'll be extra careful about the power connection and internet both Thank you. Excellent. Uh, next hand up, uh, all the way from Nigeria, the gentle giant, Enesi. We haven't heard from you in all the lectures that you've attended. I've uh, been waiting for this moment. Please unmute your microphone. The floor is yours. All right. Uh, thanks, Tom. Hi, Abdullah. Hi, long turn, <laughs> my coach umpire. <laughs> Nice, nice. Always nice to be here, Tom. Um, enjoy listening to you and Abdullah and, of course, Langton. Um, mm -hmm. Okay, quickly, um, there was a question, was it two lessons ago? I'm not sure. Um, where, um, regarding captains, a, a particular captain seeking a, the consent of another captain to play a game despite the ground weather and light. I think Langton mm. was, I'm not sure if he's, um, I'm not sure if he's correct. I'm not sure if I'm correct or I, hear, I heard him correctly, where he said, if the captains want to go on with the game, they could actually go on with the game, despite um, the umpire's um, um, view, whether the ground is okay for play, whether the weather is fine or the light is okay. That if the captains want to play, they could go on. Please, I want you to shed more light on that because I believe that the umpires are the sole judges of ground weather and light. Uh, Langton, I do remember you touching on this issue. Uh, please expand on it for NAC. Hi, NAC. How are you? Fine, thanks, Langton. Right. So. I, I think the intent of that law is when everything else is normal and play is happening the way it should, umpires are the sole judges of fair and unfair play, ground weather, light, all of that, all of that, all of that. But if the umpires say we don't think it's safe and both captains want to play, sure, we have the final decision on ground weather, light, but if players want to play, remember, we're there to facilitate play and manage play. If they're happy to take the responsibility of the umpires, 
sure, let them play. Because at the end of the game, that's what we're supposed to do for the most part, allow people to play the game. I don't know if that answers your question or not. Right, thanks. Thanks a lot, Langton. Um, um, Tom, second question. Um, I, mm. I just want to get more explanation on, um, maybe Langton will help me here too. Uh, a situation where a striker leaves his the playing area to strike a ball um, that's pitched outside the playing area. Uh, I know they'll, they'll, this, at some point there will be um, no ball and dead ball immediately or so. Please, can you just shed more light on it? You've answered your own question perfectly, NAC, but uh, I'll let Langton uh, expand and give us more detail um, on that particular scenario. I was hoping you'd leave Abdullah to answer that, but OK. Right. So because you've answered that, I'll then give you a different scenario. Mm. You've answered the ball pitches off the wicket and the batter leaves the, the wicket to play the ball. Then it has to be no ball, dead ball. But if the ball pitches on the wicket, stays on the wicket, but the batter goes off the wicket, it's just a dead ball. And the ball should count in the over because the batter was trying to get an unfair advantage. And it's something that we spoke about today um, in preparation for the tournament that I'm taking part in right now. And I'll Thanks leave that to Abdullah to say a bit more. Okay. Abdullah is nodding his head, saying that you've answered that uh, perfectly well, Langton. So uh, no need for him to expand any further. And Essie, are you happy with that? Very happy. So when when it's called no ball dead ball, so no activities ceases. Um, the free hit will it still will it still go on? That's Any correct. form of a no ball, even if the call of dead ball then comes later, you will get a free hit the the next ball. Thanks, guys. Always happy. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Tom Abdella. Long term. Thanks, and I see I'm looking forward to seeing you in uh, Lagos, Nigeria, end of October. I can't, I can't wait to have you, Tom. <laughs> and all the best in Botswana for your um, Africa T20 Women's Qualifiers. Thanks a lot, Tom. Um, it's actually um, the ACA Africa Cricket Association Tournament T20 in South Africa, but has okay. been postponed. Oh, okay. Um, Tom, Tom. Tom. Yes, yes, Marvin. I would like to add something quickly to Mr. Lantern, if possible. Uh, that's why I didn't raise my hand. Come into the noble. May I? Go, go for it. Go for it. You've got to sweep him over. Yeah. <laughs> Mr. Lantern, you there? Yes, I'm there. Oh, okay. yeah. Come into the noble will be just explained very, very uh, informative. However, if the next delivery, because it happened to me, I mean, this weekend, uh, if the next delivery is a white ball, then the free hit for the no ball, sorry, the free hit stands, right? The next delivery could still be a free hit. Am I right? That is correct, because that is not a legitimate delivery, the wide. So Another, the okay. next ball will okay. still be a free it's, hit. Okay, the free hit stands. Thank you, Mr. Lanton. Great stuff, moment. Thank you, Langton. Next hand up, Brendan, Wolfsian, Jonathan. Please unmute your microphone. The floor is yours, Squire. Uh, good evening again, guys. Um, Tom, yeah, it's not regarding any questions uh, regarding law or playing conditions. It's just um, my daughter, she's really keen to mm -hmm. do the level one umpire, like I said to you in the past, um, but she's away on. Um, with the school, she will only be back on Friday. But she's um, willing to write the exam. Maybe um, just a just a question for both of you, you and Abdullah. Will you be able to assist, or can I assist her? If there's any questions, can I contact you guys? And um, can you just send me the banking details to do the EFT for the exam? Okay, no problem, uh, Wafi. I'll send you the. Um 
EFT uh, or all the payment details. Um, when is she back? Which Friday? This coming Friday. Yeah, so the exam window period uh, runs from Monday the 4th of September until Thursday the 14th of September. So she will be back by then and she can do it at any time during those 10 days in the comfort of your home, her school, or even your office. So <laughs> there's plenty of time. There's no, um, it's not a single session that she needs to sit in on. Um, so yeah, I'm sure you'll be able to find uh, time for her to write the exam. Okay. Thanks, appreciate it. All the best and well done. I eh? really appreciate what you guys do. Thanks, Murphy. I'll just make a note to send you the details after this lecture. Okay. Thank you. All the best, everyone. Cheers. Next hand up, I believe an umpire from Gauteng in South Africa, Pratish. Please unmute your microphone. The floor is yours. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, Abdullah. Uh, thanks, Langton. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, I just have a question, not a question, trying to un uh, confirm my understanding. Uh, this is related to intervals and changing agreed time for lunch or tea interval. Um, for lunch, we said that when there is a change of innings or uh, interruption happens within 10 minutes, 10 minutes or less than uh, less than 10 minutes, before the interval, then we take lunch immediately. And for tea, we said uh, if it happens within 30 minutes, yes, we're going to take tea immediately. Uh, the other scenario is uh, where there is an interruption or any reason uh, in both scenarios, like say, for example, if it's lunch, then 11.45, the same example which Abdullah used to give, 11.45, let's, let's assume that lunch is at 12 o'clock and 11.45, there is an interruption and we won't be able to take lunch uh, until the captains, both captains and both umpires agree to it. And if they don't agree, the law tells, tells us that we, it needs to be of the agreed time, which is at 12 o'clock. Whereas for tea, right, the same thing, at 20 past two, let's assume three o'clock is the tea, and 20 past two, there is an interruption. And I heard somewhere it was said that if it if it's, strikes half past two, then we can take tea immediately. Whereas for lunch, we said that we will be having at the agreed time, which is at 12 o'clock. So I'm a little bit, uh, I just, just want more clarification on that. And if it is, if it is same, then it's good that we, even after uh, five minutes, like 11.45 till 11.50, we'll wait. And at 10, at, uh, 10 to 12, if it strikes 10 to 12, then we are allowed to take lunch or what? Uh, if it is different from lunch and uh, tea, then uh, what is the purpose behind it and how it does help us to increase the uh, maximum play? Abdullah, that sounds like one for you, my friend. Uh, please. <laughs> um, yeah, just confirm and update Pratish on the changing of intervals, lunch versus tea. Over to you. Yeah. Uh, Paratis, thanks for your Sorry, question. Before, there yeah, is, before, before, I, yeah, before yeah. you go on, did I, was I clear in my question? Because most of the times I'm confused. That's why I wanted to confirm that, was it clear in yeah, my question. Yeah, I understand exactly what you're asking. Uh, if I did not answer your question, you must just let me know. Um, sure. uh, this, uh, if you just need more clarity, I'll gladly give you more clarity, but I think I understand where you, um, sure. your question. Thank you. So in the law, there is a difference. How you um, try to uh, you know maximize play when it comes to lunch and how you maximize play when it comes to, to, uh, to tea. So I'll start with lunchtime first. So we get guided by the law. The law tells us when it comes to when it comes to uh, to lunch and trying to maximize it. Firstly, they speak about speak about an inning change. So if if a team gets dismissed ten minutes or less to lunch, 
you'll take lunch. Lunch at 12 o'clock, team gets dismissed at 11.50 or later, we'll take an early lunch. So that's an innings change. Secondly, they tell us when, there is, and when an interruption occurs, 10 minutes or less to go to lunch, 